And welcome again to Cottage Talk. I am Russ Goldman. Joining me right now is Sam Davis from Back of the Net. He's on to give us the Bournemouth perspective on this upcoming match for Fulham against Bournemouth Friday night. What a huge match. And uh, I'm, I'll am i just say this right off the bat. I already said this to Sam. I watch all of Sam's videos. I'm a big fan of Back of the Net. And uh, obviously with Scott Parker going to Bournemouth, I've been watching all of these videos, wanting to know what is going on with him and also what's going on with Bournemouth. So, Sam, thank you so much for joining me tonight to talk about this upcoming match. I think the name Scott Parker is going to come up once or twice. I think I think it might. Thanks for inviting me on, Russ. Really appreciate it. And, yeah, I'm sure he's going to be at the centre of many of our conversations tonight, I'm sure. Okay, okay. Well, listen, let's start off here. And I thought the best way to talk about this would be from the beginning because the marriage between Fulham – and Scott Parker deteriorated over the summer, and we all saw the interest from Bournemouth. And again, it probably went back a year, Sam. You could probably talk a little bit more about that. So let's get into it. Let's just get your thoughts. Walk us through. We know how we were feeling as Fulham supporters this summer. What was going through your mind and your supporters as he was being courted by your side? Were you for the move initially for Scott Parker? Well, it's interesting because some of the things that I have heard indicated that a number of the key personnel at AFC Bournemouth in the boardroom were looking at Scott Parker a lot earlier than when he actually arrived. I think they were looking okay. at that playoff final that you had uh, and you know against Brentford. And had you lost that, then that might have been the time where we might have been you know, maybe having a quiet word in his ear. But um, as it was, you got promoted. Therefore, you know, what's the likeliness of him wanting to join uh, join a championship club when you're Premier League? Probably probably slim to none. Um, So I know that uh, certain people at the club like Richard Hughes have got, um, you know, a lot of good things to say about him. And obviously, at the end of the day, they did, uh, you know, manage to get their man. And I think he's been a person that they've been after for quite a while. There were a number of names that, were mentioned, but Scott Parker to me seemed like a fairly good fit. And I think AFC Bournemouth fans, we, we were wooed by a number of different names. Look, when Eddie Howe left, the job went to his right hand man, Jason Tindall, which right. oh, he didn't really have the experience, you know, barring being Eddie's number two for a long time. But okay, he got the job. But then there were four losses in a row where we had a squad that was capable of more than the playoffs. And he lost his job and Jonathan Woodgate took over. Now, in that time, just before Jonathan Woodgate took over, we had a number of huge names being mentioned. Thierry Henry, Frank Lampard and so many. So we we're all thinking like, you know, up there. And right. we we all knew that Jonathan Woodgate's contract would have been short term. It was for 15 games. It was till the end of the season. So at that point, we were all looking towards who's it going to be next. So when Scott Parker's name was mentioned, I must admit there was a mixture of feelings. A lot of people wanting a bigger name, okay. but, for a, but for a club as, the size of us, I mean, can we really get that? Probably not. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, I thought it was a, you know, very, very sensible move, I've got to say. Okay. And you and I were already talking about this off air, because, and I've told you I'm a huge fan of Eddie Howe. So let's just talk a little bit about this because this will help us really talk about Parker. And obviously we're going to talk about Bournemouth in general, but I want to get your sense for you talked about who took over after Eddie Howe. I'm also still don't know why Bournemouth got rid of Eddie Howe. So Mm. talk a little bit about Eddie Howe because I actually wanted Eddie Howe at Fulham. I'm going to tell you that Mm. right off the bat. I wanted Eddie Howe. I thought he was a perfect fit. You and I talked about this off air as well, that you thought he would be a good fit for us. But I want to mm. get your thoughts of Eddie Howe, talk a little bit about him, but also the differences between him and then, of course, Scott Parker now. One day I think it's going to make an amazing book because we'd love to know the truth of exactly why Eddie Howe left the club. And I think it was not a case of the board wanting to necessarily let him go because at one point it looked like he was going to be like staying with us. And I think had he stayed... We, the, that would have given us the best chance to get out of the championship back into the Premier League. Totally agree. Um, but as it was, I think he probably didn't perhaps get the the um, it, well the assurances he needed from the board in terms of the money that he was going to get. Uh, we we obviously 
had some parachute payments that were coming our way. But the owner of our club is about 150, 160 million pounds into the club. And it, it was likely that we were going to lose a number of our, you know, huge players, which, you know, which we ended up losing. Uh, Nathan Ake, yeah. um, Aaron Ramsdale, Callum Wilson and a number of others. And we were only going to be signing players either on freeze or loans or very low monetary values. And in the background, we had a training project, a, a training ground project as well, which Eddie Howe was fully committed to. He's all about the long term in football. And right. he wanted to improve our facilities, our training, uh, yeah, our training um, you know, facilities that we've got. And unfortunately, I don't think the board could, you know, could say yes to that because obviously... We don't. We, we weren't to know that we could bounce back, and we didn't at the first time of asking. And it's probably one of the things that he had a few concerns over, and you know, possibly the monies that he he wouldn't have had to spend as well. So I think it it turned out to be a mutual thing. And okay. in the end, judging by the fact we hired his number two, who are who I assume would have been on considerably less money than him, it, it was probably a financial reason more than anything. Okay, so let's push forward now and look mm. at like you, you talked about Woodgate contract running out and then they go to Parker and where do you see, you know, and again, what's interesting about Eddie Howe and what you built there, you built a program is what we would say here. You built yeah. a program. So Parker comes in and like you said, maybe he wasn't getting assurances that his program was going to the next level. Maybe that's what yeah. this is really about. So here's my question for you. Why do you think Parker came to you? Well, that's a that's a really good question, and it's and it's one that many people have been wondering about. I think that him and Richard Hughes, our director of football, have got a very good relationship from their sort of brief conversations that they've had. I think it's you know it sounds like I mean I don't know the intricacies of the relationship between Parker and the board at Fulham, but it, it didn't sound incredible indeed the parting message good. yeah the parting message once he had left on on the Fulham website when the statement was made it, it, you know there were a few little sly remarks there that I thought you know what it's yep. a, a little bit catty um so it I think he just wanted a clean start with okay. a, you know a club that had a project in mind a plan in mind now bear in mind that Eddie Howe was manager of of the club whereas Parker's head coach. So we've had a restructuring of like how things work. And okay. I think we found that with Eddie Howe, he was so invested in so many different parts of the football club, like too many parts. He would probably be going to sleep, struggling to sleep. He probably won. He probably worrying at night, you know, about the person who stock, who stacks the shelves in the club shop, because basically what he does on the pitch will, you know, it will have, you know, some consequences throughout the club. He was the person who, chose what trees were planted around the training ground stupid <laughs> things like that i wow. think they've yeah and they've changed things up so that scott parker is all about football all about football yeah you know, that's all he does and he's not you know going to get involved in the rest of the stuff so you know they wanted a man that um was capable and had it on their cv that they have you know he has got team back to the premier league you know which he's done before and someone that you know wasn't adverse to um a project and someone that wasn't adverse to using youth and maybe um, was quite adept with the loan market as well because it's obvious we didn't have much money to spend. And, you know, judging by the fact that some of our star players this season are from our academy, um, then that, you know, it probably fitted Scott Parker well more than any other manager who'd be you know, perhaps asking for a bit of money. That's very interesting you say that because in the end with Fulham, it was all about, especially last season, loan players and not playing enough of the youth because we've been talking about that. Why have not more of the youth players? Why at the very end of Parker's reign do we now see mm -hmm. Fabio Carvalho, who has really come out as a huge talent? And there are other players as well. So that's an interesting question for us because it's I hear what's going on with Bournemouth, but why did that not happen more with Fulham? It's, it's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I now want to ask you about this, you know, and again, this isn't going to all be about Scott Parker, but we do have a good amount yeah, to get imagine. through on this. So this summer, and I'm going to be honest with you, Sam, I was pretty vocal about this as well, because I was to the point, listen, the marriage was bad. I didn't like the football in the end at times, you know, you, you know, you probably heard this from Fulham supporters that it was boring at times. It really was. It was boring at times. It was predictable. It was what we call Parker ball. Hmm. So, what did you make of the reaction coming from the Fulham supporters? Did you 
think that we were just hurt by Parker leaving, or did you understand that maybe there was something else to what was going on, that it wasn't just about the marriage? It might have also had to do with the results and also the style of play. I think it was a concoction of feelings by Fulham fans. Uh, probably, uh, firstly, bewilderment at the fact that he he's left Fulham, uh, you know, a relatively big club, you know, to go to Bournemouth, yep. which must be like, you know, why has he done that? But on the other hand, you've witnessed watching some games where you're not exactly enamoured with the football that you're watching. Therefore, in some ways, you're probably thinking, well, I'm glad he's gone. Um, I think it, it almost feels like the, the sort of chapter, it, well, you know, the story hadn't, quite like finished before he left and I don't know it it felt to me like um there needed to be some closure or you know from some kind of Fulham fans um in terms of you know he went so quickly um you know the writing like was on the wall but yes it it, I don't know it just didn't feel it's really hard to explain you know you know like I must admit it, it is really hard to explain and the fact that it is Bournemouth you know, like what a weird move. Um, I saw a lot of Fulham fans online saying about Parker Ball and stuff. And I've obviously seen a lot of Fulham when they were in the championship, when they got promoted. And, I, you know, some of the football that you were playing then was very good. But in the Premier League, the resistance to not use Mitrovic, uh, the style of football wasn't particularly great. I thought the writing was on the wall at a very early stage for you. Um it seemed to me like he's he's a brilliant championship manager, yet he's he's not really, you know, proved himself in the Premier League, and that and that's always been my concern. I think. Okay. Um, you know, the football that we've witnessed early on, it has been all right. It's been it's been pretty good in parts. We've seen a solidity in terms of our defence. Our attacking's not necessarily the gung ho style that Eddie Howe okay. had. His style was, well, if you score, we'll score more. When Scott Parker's two 0 up, it's almost like he puts the handbrake on. We're not used to that. We would we would rather score three, four, and five like we did under Eddie. But I don't know See, why. Now, that is. now you're seeing what we saw, Sam. I'm mm. sorry to break in. This was some of the situations we saw under form when, when they would mm. get the lead. As you said, the handbrake would be on. You would be seeing defenders coming off the bench, and it would basically be holding on for dear life. And mm. We saw a lot of that, even in the championship. I know in the Premier League a little bit, but we saw a lot of that in the championship. They get up a goal, it's late in the match, and he's bringing on defenders yeah. for like the last 20 minutes. And and it was always like, we're going to soak up the pressure. And I'm going to tell you, it was hard at times to be a supporter holding on like that. And mm. I don't know how much of that is going on. I, I know that you have had that draw in the last match. And, uh, and listen, I want to say this and anyone that watches you and, uh, you do a video, no matter what happens. And Mm -hmm. I give you full credit. I do the same. There are some other podcasts out there from a full rival that would not do a podcast for weeks after we beat them in the championship final. I, I I don't know. Maybe it was a, some team called Brentford. They would Mm -hmm. not do a video for the longest or an audio. They did a podcast. You, my friend, Right afterwards, you're posting stuff. Yeah, Win, yeah. lose, a draw. And I respect that. I respect that a great deal. But I want to get your sense of this because so you are seeing some of the things we saw at fault. Yeah, we are. And we, you know, what, what what's really frustrating, right, is that when you look at where we've dropped points and the teams we've dropped points against, we drew against Blackpool at home, newly promoted from League One. We drew against Hull away, newly promoted from League One. We drew against Peterborough away, nil-nil, newly promoted from League One. Our first loss of the season was against Preston at home, who were 19th in the league. Um, we, we've dropped points at a few places. Uh, you know, Derby County, our first loss. I mean, obviously, they are bottom of the league, but they were new, probably newly galvanised after yep. their most recent points deduction we we didn't deserve to win that though anyway so fair play to them regardless um the coventry one was an example of what you just said yes we had a man yes. sent off but we were tuning up 20 minutes to go on comes a defender and you're just inviting pressure at that point yeah. and when it went to 2-1 with i don't know how many minutes it was to go it just seemed inevitable that at some point they would score and it literally was the last kick of the game and, you know, it, it was a sickener for us, but it was absolutely deserved because you know, what happened was 
we were, you know, just pumping the balls out into channels and there was no one there to pick it up. And, right. you know, we almost needed to make the opposite of bringing on a defender, you know, you know, actually like bringing on a striker that could. Exactly. Actually That's actually what Silva has done. Hold the ball up, hold yeah. the ball up and just, you know, then we can all, you know, like all move forward as a unit. But unfortunately we had to soak up pressure, pressure, pressure. And then what happened, we conceded. And it's one of these things that we are lucky this season. We're lucky that, uh, you know, Fulham, and Bournemouth, they seem to, you know, I think that Fulham are a level of, you know, I think that you are the best team in the league. I think that you Bournemouth are very good. But thankfully, so many other teams are so bad. And Oh, I agree. You know, Sam, almost, I totally agree. You know, um, you know, Sheffield United, I thought they'd be up there. West Brom aren't doing as well as they are. No. So if we do manage to get promoted this season, yes, it would be because of some of the things that Scott Parker's instilled, but it would also be because the quality of the championship this season is actually not that good at all. Oh, it's down. There's no question about that, Sam. And I'm glad that you brought that up because we talk about that on Cottage Talk. This is mm. such a great opportunity for Fulham because it's not a good championship division yeah. this year. It's just not. Uh, what, let's be honest. It's a great opportunity for Bournemouth. Certainly a great opportunity for Fulham. I'm, I'm going to share a, a comment or two. This is from Dan Mason. I like Scott, but I wish and hoped he would have changed – the style of play. He never had a plan B. Sam, you're going to hear this a lot from Fulham supporters. So I want to get your thoughts. Has he come up with a plan B with Bournemouth? We, we heard that with Eddie, actually. That was one of the, uh, oh, the sort of... Uh, interesting. And, you know, it's quite interesting because I think we did a video on our channel about the, the you know, 10 reasons or 15 reasons why Scott Parker's a good appointment. I remember and, this. And many of the points that we made was because he was very similar to Eddie in some ways. And he never had a plan B. And Scott Parker he doesn't seem to have either. Uh, you know, we've got a, a number of injuries at the moment. And I think the media are probably overplaying the injuries that we've got. I mean, yes, we have got some key injuries. Yep. And that's um, forcing us into formational changes. But, you know, like on Saturday, the team came out at two o'clock. And we were just like, what's what's going on like <laughs> who's playing where and we genuinely did not know what on earth was happening and it took us a while to grow into the game and you know first half was was all right we took the lead it was a scrappy goal I mean it was a it was basically a cross that happened to nestle into the net so yep. I wouldn't exactly really call it a shot and you know at that point you know people on Twitter Facebook oh god he, he, he's a genius he's an absolute genius and then we go tune him up oh my god is you know what an right. incredible inspired decision and then you know things like start to unravel and when you know when Coventry scored when we had a man sent off that's where people like Scott Parker should be earning their corn and it felt like he didn't really know what to do and he was doing the thing that I think is fairly basic. Well, bring on another defender. Right. And ultimately, we paid the price. Right. And we saw that too many times, Sam. You know, and again, it's not that they would lose the lead. You know, it just was so nervy. I'm yeah. talking about two seasons ago in the championship. You said we we played a good brand of football. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't feel like we did. And I was hoping that he was actually going to be – like Slavisa Jokanovic, I'm talking about Parker. And we learned very early on that, no, he's actually playing the way he played out as a player. That <laughs> is his style of play. And mm. I think it's still playing itself out, Sam. And listen, he's doing a very good job for you. I, I want to give him full credit. I want to give full credit to Bournemouth. But I think, you know, I, I think you are – you have the right manager. I think Fulham do too. So in the way, yeah. I, I think it all worked itself out for both sides. We're both at the top of the division. But I I just find this situation interesting. It's a huge match. And I'm going to tell you this right off the bat. I think that the response he's going to get at Craven Cottage might not be, I'm just going to say might not be favorable. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. But it, it should be interesting. But Let's just talk a little bit about it because you, we talked about the style of play. So for you, you thought it was going to be Eddie Howe style of play. Mm. So you and I were talk, talking about this off air. And one of the issues that we had with Fulham is that I don't think he took advantage of Mitrovic at all. And for yeah. whatever reason, I don't think Mitrovic was his cup of tea as a striker. I think Solanke is. But as you said yourself, it's not this gung-ho type of going forward, 
style play. Fulham mm. have that now on, under Silva. So how different was this for you when you really when, when you really got in, into the season? It's been great, but it, you it sounds like you've been saying to yourself, this is not what you thought it was going to be. No, but there's a reason why we can probably accept it more than what we could usually. And that's because that we've had to use, because of the lack of money that we've had to buy new players, we've relied on loans and also the youth as well. So we've had the introduction of a number of young players that haven't really been blooded before by the way of Mark Travers in goal, Jordan Zamora on the left side of yep. defence, Jay Nantony on the on the attacking left side, Gav Kilkenny, who's been playing as a defensive midfielder, Zeno Ibsen Rossi, a centre back that played for a number of games at the start of the season. So for that reason, I don't think we would have really been able to play in the same style as Eddie Howe. So it it almost felt like a good thing to do to play his style. And we just his tried style. to make ourselves really, you know, solid as we can at the back. And then try to nip forward and score when we can, but then sit back. So at that point in time, it was okay to accept it. But then when the players started coming back that we knew um, you know, should be contributing to a better brand of football, we never really got it, but we got the wins. Right. So who were we to complain? We were grinding out wins against teams like Birmingham City. It was a it was an awful first half, one of the worst halves I've seen in ages. And on about 65 minutes, I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be such a boring nil-nil. What a horrible trip. But then we scored a set-piece goal uh, and then we scored again later on and everyone's happy. And then we win again. And then right. we win again. And then we win again. And even though it's not brilliant, you, th- you, you know, you're sort of thinking, well, it's okay then. But we were always very close to uh, conceding. Yep. We were riding our luck, it felt. Quite it's living a lot. on the edge. Yeah, it was li- and you just I was sort of thinking, okay, well, we're doing that almost too often for this to be coincidental now. Maybe like maybe we are playing the right way. Maybe it, but then re- like recently things have started to unravel and we have seen these little kind of moments like for instance that cross come shot in the 95th minute from Coventry that I've never seen anything there. quite like that. I, yeah. I was shocked by that. You know, yeah. that that goes in that that wasn't a shot. I I I don't no. think that was no, it wasn't at all. It was a blustery day down at Dean Court and it nestled in the net. And those are the little things that kind of went for us yeah. you know, early in the season. And now they're not. And, you know, it, it seems to be sort of, you know, evening itself out now. So this match on, on Friday, I think it's going to be a, a really interesting one. And I, unfortunately, I would love to see like Cherries absolutely go at the Cottagers, but I don't, I don't think we will. And I think we'll see a repeat of how we started the Coventry game with, uh, you know, three, well, you know, basically a back five. Right. Which which is not what I want to be seeing. uh, But that's, you know, that's how I think it's going to be. And, um, you know, know, for the neutral, they obviously want to see a really, you know, pulsating match end to end. I'm not sure it's going to be that. You could be right. And uh, I think Bournemouth are going to approach it that way. I, I think you're right about that. So I don't see this as a match where you're going to see both teams going back and forth at each other. I think Fulham are going to attempt to do that, but I don't see that in what Bournemouth is going to do based on the style of play, but also based on the injuries and the way that you probably will have to set up. Mm -hmm. So quickly, just get your thoughts on Fulham, you know, and again, you already talked about what you saw last season, what you saw in the championship two seasons ago. So Silva's now in charge. Mitro's on fire, but it's more than just Mitro. You know, again, Fulham are gung-ho. You know, I'm not saying that it's what it was with Eddie Howe, but it's just it's going forward as quickly as possible and get crosses in the box to Mitro. So what are your thoughts on Fulham? I mean, I know that Mitrovic is huge for you, but you, you've scored 13 more goals than us, and we're the second highest scorers in the league, and, you're, <laughs> you know, you, and you scored 49 at such an early stage. Uh, which I think is absolutely incredible. Uh, I mean, your form, yeah, okay, apart from the last two matches where you've got draws, I think you've just been sort of like a machine. And I think a lot of, you know, no, not a lot of it. A part of it is down towards the rest of the championship, you know, being so so poor. However, you know, like a lot of it is down to how Marco Silva's got you playing. And I've seen, and it's... And it is exhilarating to watch. And, you know, you've got 
Um, you've got your know, pace on both flanks. You've you know, like you know you've got you know someone like Mitrovic like in the box who you will be on the end of a chance. He's got quality. Um, I just think it you know just seems like a well-oiled machine. And even when a couple of players are injured, you're bringing on quality from the bench as well. That's where for me, when Bournemouth get a couple of injuries, that's when we start to worry because we look on the bench and all of a sudden we've got a load of youth players and we think, oh, actually maybe we're not strong as we thought we were. So if we do get you know, promote this season, there would be a, a huge job that would be needed by Parker to strengthen us for the Premier League. Otherwise, we could do what you did when you were in the Premier League last time. <laughs> oh, let's hope not, my friend. You, you, you don't want this. You know, you, you don't want yo-yo. Well, trust me on that. You don't want to be a yo-yo club. Mm. But it, it's interesting that you said that because I talked about this a great deal on Cottage Talk. You know, and again, I give you guys a lot of credit. My concern for Bournemouth always has been injuries and depth. And mm. now it's kind of showing up a little bit. So you're kind of back into what I thought we would have to watch when it came to Bournemouth. They're doing great at certain points of this. You were flying. But I'm mm. like, well, what happens when they have to deal with injuries, when they have to deal with suspensions like, you know, you've been dealing with? What, what do you do? And I think that's been something that we're going to have to see how you come out of that. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But coming up next to finish the show, I'm going to get Sam's thoughts on Bournemouth, how Bournemouth can win this match from his perspective, and also just the situation on them with their injuries and a suspension. Okay, my friend, let's get to talking more about the match, specifically about the match. Give me your key players in this match for Bournemouth. Who has to play well for you to be Fulham at Craven Cottage? Dom Solanke needs to score. Uh, Dom Solanke is a a bit of a different type of striker to Mitrovic. He, he comes deep quite a lot. He gets involved. He's got a load of assists. And when he scores, invariably, we will win the game. Uh, Philip Billing as well, the attacking midfielder. He's got a great uh, synergy between him, uh, Jordan Zemmour on the left side, who's sadly injured, but also Jaden Anthony as well. He combines really well. And he, like he's another player that when he's on the score sheet, we rarely lose matches. So in terms of the attacking uh, players, he's absolutely key for us. Um, at the back, this is where we may have problems because you know Gary Cahill, he's a veteran. I was going to say, what's the situation with Cahill going yeah, into this he, match? He's he, he's probably going to be injured. He um he picked up a rib injury not so long ago in um in one of our last matches, and he's unlikely to feature, which means we've basically got a makeshift. Well, I mean, all of our back four that we would usually have will not be playing. We'll okay. be playing Jordan, uh, Jordan Zamura usually, Lloyd Kelly, uh, Gary Cahill and Adam Smith. And as it is, none of them will be featuring. So that's the kind of like position we're in at the moment. It's, it is quite scary. But in terms of the ones to watch, I, you know, I'd say that Phil Bill and um, Dom Solanke, whilst he doesn't score as many goals as Mitrovic does, his all-round build-up play, I mean, we, you know, we couldn't be without him, absolutely. And I think... Um, He's a player that I think Scott Parker would have probably wanted, you know, like at Fulham, weirdly. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, those two are, are definitely the ones to watch. Okay. I have to ask you about a player because every time I watch a video, you guys talk about Stacy all the time. Mm. So I want to get your thoughts on him because it sounds like at times, and again, I'm not watching all the matches, that he might be a weak link. Is that accurate? Uh, only recently. Uh, up until then, he's been a very solid right back for us. However, in the last few games, he's put us in situations where have basically lost us points. At Derby, he was responsible for giving away a penalty and his um, his lack of being able to clear the ball meant that they could steal in to grab the equaliser at Derby County. And then he put uh, Jefferson Lerma on makeshift centre-back, who's now suspended for this game because yep. of his sending off. He put him in the lurch by... Um, playing a ball across the back that you know he had to sort of slightly overstretch for and as a result he took out the oncoming player and he got sent off so other than that he's he's a very good player in getting forward but defensively um you know yet to be seen how quality he can be i think he's having a bit of a bad run having a bit of a confidence crisis at the moment and we have been he has been the scapegoat somewhat recently but probably deservedly so okay and uh so yeah this will be a tough test from on Friday night. Okay. And let's talk about the injuries. You've already talked about Cahill and Lerma being out. How huge is this? You said that potentially this is being blown out of proportion. 
his loss in this match? I think that um, I think one uh, media outlet was saying that we've got nine players out, which you know possibly could be true, but we're having a lot of late tests. So okay. you know whether he's going to pull a rabbit out of a hat last minute by you know bringing in Gary Cahill, I'm not too sure. It would worry me, you know, bringing them in for you know, you know such a big game. But you know what? Weirdly, weirdly, I don't think it's actually a bigger game for us as it might be for you because you've got the whole Scott Parker thing, yeah. whereas we don't quite have that. We, you know, we, like we're going to this, like we're going into this as the underdogs, the team that is, you know, you know, like injury ravaged. Our main focus is just trying to keep clear a third and keeping a healthy margin. Sure. So most, you know, most Bournemouth fans wouldn't really care if like Fulham you know, won the league at a canter. We really wouldn't. It's just a case of you know, keeping clear of third. Right. Um, we'd be happy to you know, come away with a point if we could. Okay. Excellent. And I'll just, I can't speak for all foam supporters. I can tell you for me, it is a little personal because it ended badly. And I'll just say that. And Parker coming back is a big deal for us. And then, like you said, it might be much bigger for us than it is for you. Understandably so. Okay. Let's get to it. My friend to end the show, how does Bournemouth win this match? You're going to Craven Cottage Friday night. How does Scott Parker pull this off? And you guys beat Fulham. Obviously you're capable. You have, Several players you've already mentioned them that could hurt Fulham. So, how do you win this match? I think it's got to be uh, some kind of set piece or some or some kind of counter attack. I think that's how we'll we'll probably aim to play. We'll probably aim to soak up as much as we can, which is a dangerous tactic because you know if you concede, then you have to play to get a result. And I think you know the more the match that goes on. I mean, if Fulham score early first, that will dictate, and that will be a different game that we're watching. But if Fulham right. don't score for quite a while, then we'll probably just be happy to settle into it. Um, I think that it's going to be like a counter-attack or a set piece. And at 1-0, that's where we'll just sit back and just invite <laughs> it on. So we'll have a lovely last, I don't know, <laughs> like 60 minutes of the game being on the edge of our seat thinking, oh my God, they're going to score at some point. They're going to score. Can yeah. we? Um, yeah, you know, that's the only way I can see it at the moment. It's... Okay. Um, I. I don't want to call it a smash and grab, but that's probably how we're going to win it if we do. Okay, excellent. All right. Now, this is could be difficult for you, Sam. Yeah. Predict your starting 11. Oh, this is really difficult. Um, okay, so in goal, Mark Travers. Very difficult because I'm, I'm trying to like think of the formations. He could play three three centre backs but I doubt, oh, I doubt he would so okay here we go then so I'm going to say uh, Mark Travers in goal Leith Davis left back the two centre backs will be Chris Meppham and Steve Cook right back Jack Stacey um, we'll also so in midfield we'll we'll have Jaden Anthony uh, Lewis Cook Gav Kilkenny Philip Billing uh, we'll have Ryan Christie and also Dom Solanke as well um, he may switch it whereby we'll have like five at the backs and have the wing backs, in which case it'll probably be the same group of players that I've mentioned, but slightly altered. Um, but uh, you know, that's, you know, that's what I'll be going for. And I'm, I'm just hoping players like uh, Ryan Christie, who's, who's done so well for us, but yet he's to a score. very good player, by the way, really good. And, you know, yet to score for us, but he's due a goal. So this would certainly be the match for us. If he's, a, if he's going to pop up, we'll be happy. Okay. Excellent. All right. Give me your prediction, my friend, and then I'm just going to share some comments from the Fulham supporters. Uh, right, okay. If I was to do a, a head v heart, I mean, my head's going 2-1 Fulham. My heart, though, which I I stand by, so this is going to be my sure. ultimate prediction, one all. one all. okay, which is understandable, my friend. Okay, just going to share a couple comments. We are going to have another episode. I am planning another episode where we're going to preview it from a Fulham perspective. This is strictly from a Bournemouth perspective and Major thank you to Sam for joining me tonight so we could really get his thoughts on everything Bournemouth. I'm just going to show us this game is not going to be great. This goes to what you were saying, Sam. Early goal, then game on. Otherwise, it's down to the defense of both teams. And I think Steve, my he's my friend in Spain. I think he is right. I think he is definitely right. All right, Sam. Listen, I just cannot say enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me tonight. I hope you enjoyed speaking to me about this upcoming match. Absolutely. No, thank you very much for inviting me on. Really appreciate it. Okay. Please tell everyone. And like I said, I am a huge fan of back of the net. 
I get all the alerts of all of your videos. So I'm watching all of them. I would highly recommend watching Back in the Net. Please tell everyone a little bit about Back in the Net. We haven't really talked about it. I, I want to know a little bit more. I want to know the history of Back in the Net, and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah, so Back in the Net started as a podcast in 2016. Back in the Net is part of a chant that Bournemouth sing whenever Bournemouth get a corner. So Bournemouth as a club, we were we were called Bournemouth and Boscombe Athletic up until like 1970. And whenever we get a corner, it's Boscombe. And then everyone says, you know, the title of the podcast, right. Back of the Net. Back um, the net. And yeah, we be, you know we sing that song every time because it, it sort of kind of pulls the goal you know it, it, we think it's a a very um it, it kind of like sucks the ball into the back of the net and it, 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 you know sort of any time we sing that and uh we started a podcast in 2016 i think and that went sort of really well because we didn't really have any podcasts at the time and then a few seasons ago we thought you know should we just bring this onto youtube and we did and it's worked really well, actually. Yeah. And because Bournemouth, you know, let's face it, it's a small club and we have no YouTube channels at the moment. So that's where we come along. And we've decided to, you know, fill the gap by doing just the usual things that most fan channels do, like fan chats after each and every game. Right. Um, vlogs of the game. So match day vlogs and for a real sort of honest and raw perspective. We'll have a second look review show, which um, which uh, talks about the match in a bit of depth. Preview shows, interviews with former players, that kind of stuff as well. So we've been going for three, three or so years on YouTube, and it's been, um, yeah, it's been a really good experience. Oh, that's great! And like I said, I can't say enough good things about Back of the Net. And I was just mentioning to Sam off air that I watched one of the latest videos, and uh, I, I want to go to that cafe if I ever go to England. I'll, I'll go, go to that cafe. I actually really enjoyed your view of of when you basically your vlog of of going to the match, you know the build up beforehand and then actually there, I, I think it's so well done and mm. it really gives me, you know, a feel for what it must be like to be a Bournemouth supporter. So I thank you, my friend for doing what you do for Bournemouth. You do a great job and there are other great shows as well, but back of the net top notch. So I just wanted to end by saying that. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, listen, that's going to do it. For this episode of Cars Talk, like I said, we we're hoping to have a, another episode where we'll look at it a little bit differently from a foam perspective. But we're going to wrap this up. For Sam from Back of the Net, I'm Russ Coleman. Thank you as always for watching and listening to Cottage Talk.